everybody. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here uh, and to be able to present with this uh, group, which represents such an interesting diversity, I think, in terms of our shift to a digital life and digital society. And uh, what I will focus on is learning and really the question of what uh, kinds of opportunities and risks are there in terms of young people's learning in relation to digital media and how can we maximize the opportunity. So my entry point into this work comes uh, from a study that I wrapped up a few years ago with a large team of researchers which uh, was funded by the MacArthur Foundation and was really investigating how young people's learning was changing uh, with their in, in tandem with their engagement with new technologies, specifically video games, social media, and digital media production tools. And the study was really, uh, it was an ethnographic study, and it was really looking to at learning outside of the classroom. So trying to understand sites of engagement, particularly around social and recreational new media use. And what we found, not surprisingly, was that young people were highly engaged with these new media technologies. And we also found that they were learning a ton of things. They were learning social skills, technical skills, uh, forms of creative expression. Uh, and these were all things that were incredibly important for young people to learn to be full participants in the 21st century. But what we also found was that it was only a small uh, proportion of those very engaged uh, learners who were connecting that learning in their social and recreational lives uh, with the learning that most adults, at least parents and educators, care about, which have to do with things like academic subjects, career <coughs> relevance, or civic and political engagement. So what we really found was that there was a persistent gap, a generation gap, and a gap in engagement uh, where young people had uh, things that they were highly engaged in and interested in in these digital worlds, and these things were not necessarily valued by the older generation, and there was a disconnect between those highly engaged activities and the kind of learning that was being offered in more formal educational contexts. So we hear a lot of talk these days about the 1% and economic opportunity. I think we need to uh, do some more thinking and talking about educational opportunity. And what does it really mean in today's digital and connected age to be among the learning elite? And could this possibly look quite different from what it used to look like to be a really successful learner, getting A's in your classroom and listening and sitting still? And in fact, today's learners were preparing for jobs that don't exist yet. And so what does it mean to breed a disposition for lifelong learning that's about adaptive, inquiry-based, demand-driven learning that takes for granted a network knowledge ecosystem of information, social connections, and communities of expertise at your fingertips? So what does it look like to be a member of today's digital learning elite? I want to make it concrete by sharing one story of a learner from our digital use study. Uh, this is Clarissa, and she was interviewed by CJ Pasco who was a researcher on our study. And Clarissa was 17 years old at the time uh, of the study. And she uh, was really interested in writing, uh, liked fantasy fiction in particular, and aspired to be a screenwriter. And a few of her friends from school who also shared a similar interest introduced her to an online role-playing board. And for those of you who aren't familiar with these sites, these are sites where uh, people get together and they interactively write fiction together. And so Clarissa had to apply to be able to join the site. She wrote a long character description. She submitted it, and she was accepted to the site, much to her delight. And it was an amazing experience for her because she was able to connect with those friends from school who already shared this interest. But suddenly, she had a whole social network and community of peers who shared the same set of interests and who had a lot of knowledge and expertise and who were committed to very high standards in terms of writing, the high engagement, and giving feedback on each other's work. So what's so different, and she describes this, uh, between the learning that she was getting in her writing classes at school and what she was getting in this online community is this peer-to-peer -peer interaction where the people who are writing and sharing work are also those giving constructive and critical feedback. And they're all united by a shared sense of purpose and interest that drives the engagement and the identity of the site. Now, Clarissa was really articulate about the difference in that kind of learning 
and the kind of uh, learning where you're writing for a grade and for you know one teacher in a classroom. But what was interesting about her was she was able to take the learning she was doing in her informal and peer space and make it relevant for school. So she actually submitted a 100-page screenplay that was derived from her role-playing writing as a school assignment. And then she submitted writing samples, uh, again derived from her role-playing work, for her college uh, applications. And she got into some very competitive schools, and she attributes a big part of her success to the skills that she developed in her online community. So if you look at Clarissa's learning, she started from uh, the starting point of interest and a passion around fantasy fiction, and then she was able to reach out to an online community of peers who supported and fueled learning and expertise in that area of interest. And then what was unique about Clarissa and what made her different from almost all the young people we talked to in our study was she was able to advocate for the importance and relevance of those interests in an academic context. So Clarissa is an example of what we have come to call a connected learner. And connected learning is really that learning that happens when you're able to pursue an area of interest, affinity, and passion with a supportive social network of peers and uh, experts who fuel learning and discovery in that area of interest, and in turn are able to connect that learning in the informal, peer-based, and interest-driven space into sites of opportunity, such as uh, the school context in Clarissa's case. Now the moral of the story of uh, Clarissa's learning is not that the digital world somehow enables all young people to be like Clarissa. In fact, it's the opposite, that it's not the technology that's going to drive it, but in fact many more young people could have access to this kind of learning if there were more principled invitations, interventions from the point of view of schools, parents, educators, and meeting young people where they are in terms of their interests and engagements. The reality now is that there's a ton of opportunity, there's lower barriers to access because of new technology to this kind of demand-driven learning, but most young people aren't taking advantage of it. So I've had the good fortune to be working with a network of researchers, designers, uh, and practitioners in MacArthur Foundation's Digital Media and Learning Initiative, uh, where we're trying to uh, develop this model, these ideas around connected learning, and put them into practice. So let me just give a little bit of uh, oh, uh, a few examples of some of the research and development we're doing in this initiative. So one example on the research side is uh, my group here at UC Irvine is collaborating with Katie Sale and this group at DePaul University, and Katie is a game designer, and we're doing studies of design practices and player communities around games that really fuel expertise and academic outcomes. So we're studying, for example, uh, Portal, uh, StarCraft II, Little Big Planet II, and these are all games that uh, really support high-level problem-solving systems thinking, mathematical and engineering type outcomes. Uh, another site, so it's not just about geek boys, is Ravelry.com that we're looking at. So this is an online community for fiber arts, knitting and crocheting. And we're trying to understand how uh, young uh, people learn this really complicated art of pattern making that has a lot of mathematical relevance. And it's really difficult to do, but they somehow pick it up within these peer uh, communities. On the development side, just a few examples. Uh, uh, at UCHRI, uh, we've been collaborating with the Mozilla Foundation in developing an open infrastructure for digital badges uh, and uh, supporting the development of online badging systems that allow young people to uh, make visible and consequential the learning that they're doing in their informal environments uh, for career, workplace relevant, school relevant kinds of contexts. Uh, another example, uh, again, my collaborator Katie Salen has uh, opened two middle schools, one in New York City and one in Chicago, which are based on a game-based pedagogy, so all of the curriculum units are about inquiry based on solving collaborative quests together. Uh, so again, it's about meeting young people where they are in terms of their interest in engagement and trying to make that relevant to school. Uh, and finally, an example that's near and dear to my heart because uh, it was in part a collaboration with our Digital Youth Project, is the UMedia Learning Lab, uh, which is a 5,500 square foot space on the first floor of the main downtown library in Chicago, uh, which is devoted uh, to being a teen-only space dedicated to the digital and creative arts. 
And this is a space, it's the only space in the library where kids can show up with food, be really loud, hang out with their friends, have access to a ton of technology and books, and peers who share these interests and drive a culture of knowledge, expertise, and skill development. And it's also populated with expert mentors who really embody the interest and identity that the teens come to the space with and librarians who also support learner-centered inquiry. And the MacArthur Foundation has uh, paired up with the Institute for Museum and Library Services uh, in supporting the extension of this model to other museums and libraries around the country. They're supporting the development of 10 uh, new learning labs uh, every year for the next three years. So it's really exciting to see some of these models start to take hold. Now we're still really in the early years of trying to understand how we can look to the opportunity that today's digital and network world has to broaden access to the kinds of interest-driven, socially supported, and demand-driven forms of learning that we're trying to promote through our connected learning model. Uh, at UCI, we've been uh, developing this site, connectedlearning.tv, which is an effort to surface the core principles, exemplars, uh, to offer webinars, in order to start to catalyze a broad community of people that cut across, again, like Scott was saying, it's the cross-sector approach uh, that includes educators, technology makers, folks uh, in entertainment, parents, young people, uh, of kindred spirits who really are engaged in these forms of social, interest-driven, and technologically connected forms of learning. Uh, we're really early in this process. We're looking for more kindred spirits, other engaged partners. So I really um, am looking forward to the opportunity to connecting with all of you about this, too. Thank you.